Okay, I'm going to start with a question I've been asked about a dozen times in the last week. A few of you are getting first quarter numbers for your companies, right? Which is a bit disconcerting because you thought you were done with your DCF and now the game seems to have opened up. So the question I've been asked is, do I have to, that's really the question, update my numbers for first quarter numbers? Of course, the answer you'd love to hear is no, just don't stay with it. The problem is you're giving your recommendation on May 9th of 2022. You're asking me to buy or sell. Clearly, those numbers should reflect updated numbers. That said, though, for most of you, your valuation is not going to change by bringing in a new quarter. Because remember, what drives your value is the story about revenue growth and margins. So if there's nothing in the first quarter numbers that's going to lead to a massive shift, I would expect your value per share to change dramatically. It might change by 3% this one. But you always have the exception, right? I know there are at least five people in this class valuing Netflix. Your life just got a really messy over the last 24 hours. Because if you read, like, after close of trading yesterday, Netflix came out with its new, and they must be really panicking because not only did they reported loss of subscribers, what else did they say they were exploring? Password. That No, actually, the password that they're going to talk about, there's really not much they can do, to be quite honest, because they start cracking down on passwords, that, that, that stream will become a river of subscribers leaving, right? I mean, I've, and I'll confess, Netflix might find out about this. There are five people in my household who share Netflix. But I pay, pay the 70, 99, or whatever, four streams. If they say each of us is to buy Netflix, four of us, maybe all five will drop out. But there was some, something else that they announced they were exploring, which is a lower cost version of Netflix where you see ads. Something that they've never wanted to do. The very fact that it's on the table suggests to me that this is actually scarier than it looks. There's something going on under the surface that they're seeing that's not yet in the numbers. No. So if you're valuing Netflix, should you update? I think you should. Your value is going to be lower, but the price is down 35% today. 35%, that's... I don't know, $50 billion off, gone. In, in, in. You might have found your stock to be overvalued a week ago, two weeks ago when you did your DCF. Today, your value might be 10% lower, but your stock might now be undervalued. These things can shift in seconds in markets. And I think if you have a company with something significant has happened in that first quarter, I think you should. I mean, there it's not a question of should you absolutely have to. But if not much has happened, your story hasn't changed, you won't leave your numbers with 2021 numbers because, you know, I'll tell you, it takes about 15 minutes to update your valuation. Uh, and I'm not underestimating. Basically, all you do is you copy the latest year column into the second column. You make that the last 10K and you replace that first column. It's 11 numbers, I think, with trailing 12 month numbers. So if you want to do it, it's not a whole lot of work. And I would suggest that you do it at least for companies where significant things have happened that change your story for the company. So let's talk, today we're going to complete our private company valuation. In particular, we're going to talk about IPOs. Okay. So let me start with the question. You play the role of a banker. I want to take my company public. I come to you to set an offering price. You do an intrinsic valuation. Let's say you're a true believer in intrinsic valuation. You put a DCF model, the value come up with is $10 per share. Then you do a pricing of that same company. It's a social media company or a cloud company, you price it against other companies. You come up with the pricing of $20 per share. So you've got two numbers floating around, right? 10 or 20. 
as a banker, when I ask you to put a number on the company, given your mission, and you can flesh out what that mission is, which of these two numbers would you use as your basis for the IPO, the intrinsic value or the pricing? I'm sorry, go ahead, Matsi. You think the intrinsic one? Let me ask you this question. Let's suppose I want to sell my house and you're my realtor. And I ask you, how much will I get for my house? And you work through the, you've got this elaborate intrinsic value model for a house based on rental income. You plug in the numbers and you say 500,000. And people in the neighborhood are paying a million dollars for houses. You know how long I would keep you as a realtor? Because your job is to do transactions. Do you see where I'm going? If you're a banker in an IPO, your job is a pricing job. Or put simply, stop doing discounted cash flow valuations for IPOs and acting like you care about intrinsic value. You don't care. Nobody cares. Your job is a pricing job. Yeah. I have a question. If I'm a banker, why wouldn't I want my client to have like entire subscription and I would just well, your client is getting $10 and it's of 20. That's not, so if I'm your client and you said, this is why I'm doing it for you. I'm going to say, please stop helping, right? Because the, I want to get the 20. I don't want to get the 10. And even if your intrinsic value is higher than the 20, you don't dare go to the market at that because you're not going to get it because people are willing to pay only $20. This is a pricing job and I don't yeah. care about pricing. But if you understand the structure of IPOs, at least the way IPOs have been structured for the last century, you as a banker go beyond setting an offering price. You guarantee me that price. You know how this works? Is you guarantee the price and if the actual price is lower, you make up the difference. Given that it's a guarantee you're giving me, let's say you start with the $20 you know, as your base. Would you set your price at above 20 at 20 or below 20? Think about your incentives. I would set it up below 20 so you purchase it inside and you yeah. sell it for more. Clearly, you want to set a discount, right? To protect yourself. That sounds like a bad idea for your client. After all, when you set it at a discount, you get, you're transferring wealth from the founder, owner of the company to the people who get the shares at the offering price. We're going to show evidence today that a typical IPO is underpriced by about 15%. Not every IPO doesn't mean it's a guaranteed profit. Typically, IPOs, it's called the IP the company. It's every day that. Okay. So the typical IPO gets underpriced, but it's no mystery why. This underwriting guarantee almost guarantees that it'll be underpriced. So, as a client, as I said, this is money out of your pocket, right? So, I'm going to give you two scenarios so you can see why you, as a client, might be okay with it. If you have a company and you're selling the entire company in the offering day, all the shares are going to be offered. And I price the stock at 25% below the $20 I could get. Would you go along with this deal? If I'm going to sell your entire company at a 25% discount, you probably say, no, I'm not going to leave 25% on the table. I mean, remember, the, an underwriting guarantee is useless if I don't tell you at what price. If I guarantee you, I can sell your, I, I guarantee I will sell your house by next week. And I ask you, how much would you pay for the guarantee? You know how much you should pay for the guarantee? Nothing, because I didn't mention the price. I might sell your house for $10 to the homeless guy down the street and say, look, I sold your house. I'm done with, without a price, a guarantee is pointless. And bankers set prices so low that really the guarantee becomes almost useless. But here's where it gets interesting. Most IPOs, 100% of the shares don't get offered in the offering day. It's not even 50, it's not even 30. It's a number that's actually been dropping over time. It's now about 10 to 12% on a big IPO. Sometimes it's lower than that. If I'm offering only 12% of your company at a discount, might you be okay with me selling the shares at a discount? And if so, how would you rationalize it? Yes. Because then there will be a lot of movement and people will sell and the price will keep going up. 
the at least that's a, that's a hope, right? Basically say, tomorrow the, the new story in the Wall Street Journal will say, your stock price jumped 20% on the offering day. Other people are going to read the story. And as human beings are want to do, what do they do? They want to be, it's a, it's a FOMO effect, right? You, you've let, you missed the party. Now you want to make this your party. You buy shares. You keep pushing the shares up. And which is you need this to continue for long enough because remember you're locked your shares are often locked from trading for three months or six months or a year after you so you hope that the momentum lasts it's a hope but you can see why many owners are okay with that discount happening if the discount is 80 percent. i'm still going to be pissed off there's this sweet spot for bankers in fact if you look at ipo pricing manuals at banks this is explicitly part of the process. Come up with the price, knock off 15% or 20%, partly to give a buffer and partly to provide this publicity effect or momentum effect that carries through. So today we're gonna to talk about the process of pricing IPOs. We're also gonna talk about the process of valuing IPOs. Bankers don't have to do it, but you know who might be interested in that? If you're a potential investor, not a trader, and you're saying, should I buy the LIC IPO, big Indian IPO coming out? As an investor, I don't care what bankers want to set as a price. I'm interested in holding the stock for the long term. I might still want to value. So we'll talk about both valuing and pricing IPOs and how this plays out in practice. So let's turn back to packet two. I left you with this discussion of illiquidity discounts. And if you remember, I said there are two ways in which appraisers, practitioners have justified these 25, 30% discounts. One is through studies of restricted stock and the other is through studies of pre-IPO transactions. And I mentioned there's a sampling issue with both those studies. With restricted stock, healthy companies don't issue restricted stock. So what you get as a result reflects the fact that it's the sickest of companies the most unhealthy companies that issue restricted stock. So maybe the discount is big, not because of illiquidity, but because of that sampling problem. These are companies that are in trouble. And with IPOs, I said, not all IPOs go to fruition. So by looking at only the IPOs that have happened and working backwards, you might get a sampling bias that makes it look like people are selling for 30% or 40% below the IPO price. You're saying, what choice do you have? You need to be able to observe illiquidity. I don't know whether you remember, but that's, when I started this discussion of illiquidity, I talked about buyer's remorse. And I said, if you buy a public company and you change your mind and sell it back right away, the cost of buyer's remorse is not the brokerage or trends, which is close to zero now, it's the bid ask spread. So if you have a stock that's trading at $5, it's actually not trading at five. If you want to buy it, you might have to pay five, you uh, know, 505. And if you want to sell it, you get only 495. There's a spread of 10 cents. That is an illiquidity discount on public companies. If I take that 10 cent difference and divide by the $5, I get a 2% illiquidity discount. Not much, right? But there are NASDAQ companies where the stock price is $2, but the spread is 50 cents. 50 cents to buy by $2 is a 25% liquidity discount. You see where I'm going to go? Now, if I want, if you ask me, where can I find evidence on liquidity discounts? I said, look all around you. There are you know, 7,000 listed US stocks. I can get the bid ask spread on each of them. I can take the spread as a portion of the price and come up with the liquidity discount in each of these companies. I now have the whole market. There's no sampling bias. I have a much bigger sample. And here's what I'm going to do with that spread number. I'm going to take that spread across publicly traded companies and try to explain why the spread varies across companies based on observable variables. So I tracked what Bill Silber did with restricted stock and said maybe bigger companies have smaller percentage spreads than smaller companies. I threw in the size of the company. I threw in how much cash they had. The argument being companies which are liquid, lots of cash, should have smaller spreads. I threw in trading volume. Obviously, the more liquid you are as a company, the smaller the spread will be. And ended up building a regression across publicly traded US companies. So that's what the regression looks like. That's across all companies. I even threw this dummy variable, maybe money losing companies have bigger, better. So I have now a much bigger sample and a regression across the sample. All of those coefficients were statistically significant. 
You think, this doesn't help me. I have a privately owned restaurant. How the heck do I use this to come up with, a, with a, an illiquidity discount? Take a look at each of these variables. Can I get the revenues for the restaurant? Yeah. Can I get the, whether it's making or losing money? Absolutely. Do, do I know how much cash they have? It's on the balance sheet. You think, but there's no trading volume. There is. It's a trading volume of zero. I can put in zero into the regression. If I plug in the numbers for, for this restaurant that I just valued, of what its revenues are, it's making money, how much cash it has, and the fact that it's not trading, I come up with a predicted bid-ask spread for this privately owned restaurant of 12.88%. What the heck does that even mean? Based on how liquidity is being priced in public markets, this restaurant should have an illiquidity discount of roughly 12.88%. That's what the spread tells me. I've essentially taken what I've learned from looking at public companies and applied it to private businesses. The advantage of doing this as opposed to doing these restricted stock studies is I can constantly update. You know what happens to spreads across companies during crises? They tend to increase. So if I'm using this approach, I can adjust the spread if I'm in the middle of a crisis. I can update it, I can clean it up. So I have actually measures of discount that vary depending on which approach I use. If I use the bludgeon approach, which is what appraisers do, not 25% off, I'm just going to take 25% of my estimated value of 521,000. If I use the silver adjustment for the fact that they have small revenues, the discount tends to be a little higher, I take off 28.75%. But with the bid-ask spread approach, I basically think I'm overestimating my liquidity discount with both those approaches. And if I use that smaller discount, my estimated value for the equity is 454,000. So when you think about illiquidity discounts, it's easy to fall into those established paths. Step back and think bigger. Think about the fact that everything is illiquid. It's only a question of degree. Nothing is completely and perfectly liquid. Liquidity basically means you can sell it and you have no cost at all. I can't think of a single asset where there is no illiquidity. It's only a question of degree. And once you have that recognition, you can expand your sample to then look at all traded assets. Any questions on illiquidity? Yes. Sir, I have a question. I'll, I'll answer the Zoom question. Okay. Go ahead. So uh, how would we measure the bid ask spread? Would it be on an average basis or a closing basis? Or uh, how would this... I don't, to be. I don't think it matters. Spreads don't vary that much over the course of a day. It's a percent of the price. The price will vary across the day, right? The spread as a percent of the price is what I'm computing. So it's very unlikely that you're going to see the spread be 50 cents at the start of the day and 10 cents at the end of the day. The price might vary across the course of the day. But you could average spreads across a year if you want to. I would say use whatever that is easiest to get data on, right? Because you have to get this data for every publicly traded company. And sometimes beggars can't be choosers. You might have to use an average spread over the year because that's what they report divided by the average stock price during the year. But you're coming up with a scale measure of the spread. Awesome. Thank you. Question. In a private, yeah. Well, let's say let's let's move one step. Let's say you buy a very very lightly traded Nasdaq company. It's publicly traded in, or an Egyptian stock. You know, the Egyptian stock market is so liquid that they used to have a chalkboard in front of the market and fill in every trade. The guy would write the trade. Tells you how many trades happened during the course of a day. That a guy writing the trades on a chalkboard could fill all the trades during a day. You buy an Egyptian stock or a NASDAQ company that you know, doesn't have a market yet. You bought a publicly traded stock in name, right? But if you try to sell it, guess what you're going to face? You're going to face exactly the same challenges you would face with a private business which is you got to go find a potential buyer. There is no market for it. You might find a broker, but the broker is going to take a hefty chunk of what you have. So what I'm saying is, you know, rather than think of private companies in liquid and public companies as liquid, think of this as a, as a continuum. At one end, you have really, really liquid publicly traded companies where the bid-ask spread is a fraction of a percent. You take the Fang Am stock, for instance, 
what you face is a mid aspirin which will be like one tenth of a percent, and that's probably a high number. But within the publicly traded market, if you look at very lightly traded stocks, it can become as high as 18, 20, 25%. What I'm saying is I'd perhaps rather hold this restaurant than one of those really, really lightly traded stocks in terms of what I'm gonna end up facing as an illiquid discount. I'm putting this private company into that continuum. Now, it's a little tricky because zero trading volume sounds you know, like you're off the page, but what's the real difference between zero trading volume and one trade every month? Right? It's pretty much the same thing. So I'm putting it into the same group of companies and coming up with a spread, which effectively is the same thing as an illiquidity discount. So that's the private company value. You had a question? No. So we've talked about the two big issues with private companies to private company transactions. One is the lack of diversification of the part of the buyer, which pushes up your discount rate. The second is the worries about illiquidity that push down the value. Let's take the second scenario. You have a private company, but you're selling to a publicly traded company. So in this case, let's assume that this restaurant has been approached by a publicly traded restaurant company that wants to add this restaurant on to their, to their portfolio of restaurants. Your buyer now is a publicly traded company. Let's see how the valuation is going to shift. Let's take each piece. When I did my cost of equity with private to private, I went to a total beta, right? The argument was not because the seller is not diversified, it's because the buyer is not diversified. Here, if it's a publicly traded company, the investors in that company can be diversified. The company doesn't have to be diversified, the investors can. So first thing you're gonna start see me do is shift back to a market beta. And then once you become part of a publicly traded company, if, I want, if I'm an, an owner of the publicly traded company shareholder, and I want, to, I want to convert my holdings to cash. I don't have to sell the restaurant, I just sell my shares. That's why we don't discount for illiquidity within public companies. Because if you think about the assets that a publicly traded company own, they're illiquid. But we don't care as owners of the company because we're not selling the assets, we're selling our share of the company. So here's what happens. Instead of using the public private company numbers, which gave me a value, which, are, which gave me a high cost of capital, I'm going to go back to a public company number. So first, the 8.76% would be the cost of capital to a public buyer. I'm going to replace the 14.25 with the 8.76. And if I put in that lower cost of capital and take away the liquidity discount, my value of equity, which was 454,000 with the private to private transaction is more than tripled. This is like magic. By finding a better buyer, my potential value has more than tripled. But be very clear about where the increase in value is coming from. First, I remove the diversification effect. So I'll go back to market beta. Second, there's no more illiquidity discount. What do I learn from this? If you're a small business owner, it's always better to try to find a public buyer than a private buyer. You're going to get a higher price often because that public buyer has the advantage of being a little more casual about risk than a private buyer. But let's say you are the owner of the restaurant. Do you think if you go to a publicly traded restaurant company and demand 1,484 million that they're just going to be say, okay, you've done the calculations, we'll pay you 1,484 million. You think they might counter? What do you think they might counter at if, if you know if you do at the bargaining table? They're going to bring up lack of diversification and liquidity even though it doesn't really apply. Say, but you're small, you're illiquid. They're going to try to push you back towards the 453,000, right? And if they're the only buyers in town, it's them or another private buyer, guess what the number is going to get pushed down towards? It's going to get pushed down towards the 453,000. It doesn't sound fair, but life isn't fair. If there's only one buyer in town, that buyer is going to be able to buy your company at 454,000. Who gets in the difference in value? The public company that is buying you essentially claims the difference. When we talk about m and I'm going to paint a very negative picture of most acquisitions. Most acquisitions destroy value. But there are a couple of exceptions. One is when public companies buy private businesses. It often happens in what are called roll-ups where you buy private businesses. Blockbuster Video, for instance, was created by rolling up independently owned video stores around the country. 
Browning Ferris was created by rolling up privately owned garbage businesses around the country. You see why they have a potential to be successful? You could go around town by town buying small private businesses to be to, to act generously, you throw in a little bit more than the 454,000. So look, I'll be generous. I'll pay you 50,000 more. And you know what? The private buyer is pretty happy because their next bid, bid would have been another private buyer. But you bundle up these companies overnight. You've created this increase in value because you've essentially created a public company which can now get rid of that company specific risk. So as you look at private businesses, you can see why if you're so if you're working for the private company, you should have two numbers in your pocket. One is the 454,000 in your left pocket. That's a value to another private buyer. The other is the 1,000 in your, and remember which pocket is which number because this could be deadly if you don't. So when you start your negotiating, you pull out the 1,483, you act very confident. You claim there are other buyers outside the room just waiting for you. But remember the pushback is going to be if there are no other buyers, you're gonna get pushed towards the 453. And you hope to make at least more than the 453 because you want to walk away with more than you'd have made selling to another private company. Let's now talk about private companies to initial public offerings. So you've had a private company, it's getting ready to go public. You've been asked to value the company for a public offer. It's now going to become a public company, right? You should never use a total beta to value an initial public offering. Why? Because the minute you become public, investors have the choice to be diversified. If they choose not to, that's their problem. So the valuation of a private company for an IPO is very similar to the valuation of any public company. But there are a couple of things specific to IPOs that can make them tricky. So let me take uh, you know, my Twitter valuation from October 5th of 2013. I did this at the time, Twitter filed its prospectus. One of the things I try to do when a company decides to go public is the minute they file their prospectus, I try to value the company, but I try to do it before the bankers start to put a price. You know why I do that? Because the minute you hear the banker's price, whether you like it or not, it starts to weasel its way into your valuation. So I took the prospectus, I took the financials, I told the story of Twitter. And the story I told about Twitter on October 5th of 2013 was it was a company with lots of users that hadn't quite figured out how to monetize them. Strange, if I were valuing Twitter today, which I'm doing right now, the story I'm telling for Twitter still, the company with lots of users that hasn't figured out how to monetize them. It's amazing, the story is stuck. No. But at that time, I had a more upbeat view of Twitter. I thought that they would figure a way to monetize these users, in what form? I expected their margins to improve over time to 25% and their revenues to increase as they became a bigger part of the advertising market. But even then I was realistic. I said, there's no way Twitter ever becomes Facebook. And here's why. Facebook can be a primary advertising venue. Twitter will always be a secondary advertising venue. No company can make Twitter its entire ad because it's the, because of the nature of the platform, right? It's a, it's a platform where people don't stay on very long. Your ads have to look like tweets. So I did give them revenues of 11 billion. I was accused in, in 2013 of being incredibly pessimistic with my revenues. You know, the actual revenues for Twitter are, you know, we're very close to year 10 in this forecast. Right now, the revenues are about 5 billion and its margins are like 5%. So in hindsight, I was actually being hopelessly optimistic my projected revenues and margins over time. But I did a conventional discounted cash flow valuation. So you value the assets, you add cash, but here's where the difference is coming. When you do an IPO on the offering day and you sell shares, cash coming to the company. The how to buy series I. Click how Could you please turn off your mic, whoever's on Zoom? I can hear your mic. I have $15,000 worth. You can't cash them out for a year, so you won't need for a little while. This might be a good place to park it to beat inflation. Follow basic financial literacy. Somebody's giving a lecture in the background here. I don't even know who it is. Okay, maybe they, they discovered they were lying. Okay. So on the offering day, you raise cash. What happens to that cash? What are the three things that that a company can do with cash they receive? on the offering day. 
One is just hold it, right? Because reinvesting, right? They might not need it right away. They can just go hold. So the day after the IPO, it becomes an increase in the cash value. So that's one. What's the second? I think uh, they can use it as working capital. Or they can use it to cover payoff debt or anything that they think is badly financed. So there's a third one. Spotify, on its offering day, kept none of its cash. You see, what happened to it? You know what they allowed owners? Of, they were investors in Spotify, venture capitalists. Sony was an investor in Spotify. They allowed existing owners to cash out. So you could keep the cash, use the cash to pay down debt or meet working capital needs right away, or you can let existing owners cash out. The third option is the easiest one to deal with in discounted cash flow valuation. If you let people cash out, that's money in, money out. It doesn't affect your valuation. But if you get money in and you keep the money, guess what it does? It increases your cash balance. You see the IPO proceeds of a billion? Those are the proceeds from the offering that will push up your value because that increases you. It's like an increase in your cash balance overnight. Then you subtract our debt, you get a value for the equity. There were options outstanding. And that's another feature of, of young companies going public is you got to mop up. There are lots of options, lots of preferred shares. Everything has got to be brought into valuation. But the bottom line is based on what I saw in Twitter at the start of October of 2013, the value per share was $17.36. Yeah. And the number of shares? Do you say that? yeah, that's actually one of the trickiest parts in a, an IPO. Most IPOs, when you start, there will be a number that's floating around because the, even if private companies have share counts, but they'll be in the form of preferred, they had seven class of preferred shares, all of which would become shares. So it's not a private business, one owner and no shares. They often have shares, but the shares will get adjusted after the IPO. So it is a, you know, it's not an easy number to nail down because you have multiple classes of shares that all will get converted and you will get more clarity on it the closer you get to the offering day. Because often you'll have a first prospectus where the number is actually left blank on the prospectus. But as you get to a second issuance, which happens about three weeks later, the numbers will start to get filled in. Because a banker ultimately has to specify a share count to set an offering price. So there will be some estimation early on that might get cleaned up as you go get closer to the offer. So the value per share is seventeen dollars and thirty six cents. You the I don't know whether you remember, but uh, do you remember what the initial offering price for Twitter was set at? Because it, the I think the offering price was set on November third, about four weeks after I did this valuation. It was actually initially set around 20, which terrified me. You know why it terrified me? Because it was so close to my value. And I said, I must have done something wrong if bankers are agreeing with me. Okay. But they actually pushed it up to 26, which actually gives you some sense of, this is nothing to do with intrinsic value. You know how bankers, re or why bankers often reprice an offering? The way bankers come up with the price is not with some deep analytics. They get on the phone, they call portfolio managers, they throw a price out there, would you be interested? The portfolio managers sound too interested. You know what they do? They hang the phone up and say, that was too low. Let's try a higher number, 22. Would you still be interested? We're too, too excited still. No. This is just gauging demand and supply, which is what pricing is. They actually set the offering price at $26, November 7th of 2013 was opening day, much less exciting than baseball opening day. I was actually, I don't know, in one of these, uh, one of these TV shows, I, I didn't think it was CNBC, it might've been Bloomberg, they asked me to come in for the opening because I think they wanted to humiliate me by saying your price was 1736, look at how different the value was. I said, I'll be in because I don't get easily humiliated. Market opens, of course, at 9.30 and Twitter doesn't open. 10 o'clock still doesn't open. 10 30 does. You know why? Because the demand and supply were so uneven, they couldn't open the market. It opened at 11 30 at $45 per share. So they got their chance to crow. And in fact, the stock kept coming up. Momentum, the momentum kicked in, right? The, the good news, everybody joined in. By December 26th, of 2013, we're still talking within weeks of the offering, the stock hit $73.31.
the price Twitter did not see again for eight years. Because that happened to be the high, if, if the story had ended there, this would have been a happy ending, right? Jack Dorsey, greatest entrepreneur ever. Look at it, Twitter goes public, $73.31. Stock, of course, went on an eight year run, mostly down. Briefly in 2021, I think, or 2020, towards the end of 2020, the stock went back up above 73.31. It went to 77.50 or something. And many people in Twitter are saying, look, we could be worth more. We used to trade, they don't want to, they just pick the high points. So look, we used to trade at 73, 77, but now it's back down to 42. But that's kind of finishing the story. But in this case, if you ask me for a discounted cash flow valuation, my discounted cash flow, in fact, at the time that I posted this, I also did a pricing of Twitter. Do you remember that pricing where I took the number of users, multiplied by $100, and I said, look, I'm done. Not the most sophisticated pricing, but the pricing would have yielded roughly $45. If I were the bankers, I would have stopped being distracted by all this crap, just taken the number of users, multiplied by 100, and I'd have been pretty close to the actual pricing of the stock. But it kind of brings home how much of this is pricing. So let's focus in on IPOs and what the specific issues are. One is the use of proceeds. As I said, you need to know what that is. If it's going to be taken out by the owners, you can ignore it. If it's going to be kept in the company as cash, you got to count it as an additional cash balance. If it's going to be used to pay down debt, you got to change your debt ratio and your cost of capital and recompute what the cost of capital would be. You also have to think about any special deals that have been made with venture capitalists along the way. Because all those bills are going to come due. No venture capital is ever going to walk away from something he's been offered at the company. That's why you have all these options to clean up. And of course, the pricing issues, is you've gone to a bank where the banker sets guarantees a price, that process almost is guaranteed to deliver a lower price. So on the proceeds taken out of the firm, ignore it, used to pay down debt, change the debt ratio, held as cash, just added on. And that amount you get on the offering can be a pretty substantial amount. When Alibaba went public, the value that I came up for the firm was about 135 billion. But they raised 20 billion on the offering day. That adds 20 billion to your value right away. It sounds like a freebie, but it's not because the share count also reflects that additional amount. But you need to do that because if you adjust just one and ignore the other, you're gonna misvalue the company. So in the case of Twitter, they did say that they were going to raise about a billion. So it was a rumors because you really don't know how much a company will be raising until much close to the offering day. They did say they were planning to keep that cash to meet future investment needs, which kind of makes sense. You're a young company, you're going public, you probably should keep the cash. And you know, if, uh, if, if they said they were going to withdraw the proceeds, only thing to do differently in the valuation is go back and take the billion dollars out the value per share would be much lower because the cash would have left the company. Any questions on how to deal with IPO proceeds and how they're affected? Is the uh, proxy for the market value of equity in this just the book value of equity until they actually go public? Where do I use it? Uh, just going back when, for instance, when you're doing a cost of capital per se. For the weights in my cost yeah. of capital? I actually use my estimated value of equity. Remember that, that iteration trick yeah. that you okay. tried? So because I have an estimate of the value by doing my DCF, as long as I check my iteration box, I actually use those weights. And in the case of Twitter, it's not gonna make much of a difference. And luckily in many young companies, it's not gonna make much of a difference. You know why? Because that, that is such a small amount. That's the difference between 1% versus 2% of the cost of capital. Right. Twitter is almost entirely equity funded. So the cost of capital reflects the cost of equity and having a different debt ratio is not gonna change that because it's so low. Yeah. Well, the cash flows, if you look at the cash flows, are negative, right? Yeah. So basically, I'm assuming you need cash in future years. You know what the billion gives them? They've just basically raised the cash up front. They can use that billion to cover those negative cash flows for the next five years. But I count the billion as part of their cash balance, and I leave the negative cash flows as is, as lowering the present value. Like the option oh, no, basically that billion is what's going to cover it. So if I use the billion and remove those negative cash flows, 
Oh, they are planning to use the billion to cover those negative cash flows. That's exactly what the plan is. But the right way to reflect that is to show the billion as part of their cash balance. They've raised the money, leave the investment needs still as lowering the present value. But what you have is uncertain investment needs in the future and a certain amount of cash on hand. It makes them more likely to survive as a company. It reduces their failure rate and it increases the cash balance. So that 1 billion is for future investment needs. But the best way to treat it is to do what I just did. Add the cash balance today, leave the investment needs in your cash flows. You get negative cash flows. So, I mean, yeah. they say, no, we are going to give you a bigger of the billion. The billion, so we can have to Then you take the billion out. And also like uh, what you mentioned, like, like uh, they could go viral. Like, yeah, your failure or property will also be higher. So what will happen if they take the billion out is my value, my discounted cash flow value will drop and you now have a greater chance of failure as well because you now have these investment needs and you've not set aside. That's why when you see young companies in need of capital with owners cashing out, it's not a great sign for shareholders in the company because it makes the company less valuable and more risky at the same time. As for prior equity investors, as I said, mop up. There's a lot of mopping up to do. I remember when I valued Facebook, there were 16 different preferred stock issues. In fact, you can count how many VC rounds a company's had by just counting the number of preferred. Because each time you have a VC round, you often create a new preferred stock issue because each VC has a very different structure. And luckily, in most IPOs, all of them get converted to common shares. And they'll specify. So what's the share count? It'll run to two pages. You might have to deal with restricted stock, but it's your job. Don't trust an analyst estimate of share counts of young companies. They're almost always wrong. You've got to clean up on your own because you want to make sure you get the share count as close to the right number as you can. And that might require retweet. Yes. It's convertible preferred actually. So basically it's just conversion option. For whatever reason, it's become this practice among VCs to call it preferred stock. It's almost all conversion options. There are really warrants that are issued with a little bit of a preferred stock with a cash flow claim. You know why VCs like the cash flow claim? It increases their power over the company because they say, you owe me the preferred dividend. I'm going to extract even more terms from you for not doing it. So it's really almost all equity. It's conversion option. So this is what Twitter had. It had uh, the common shares at seven classes of convertible preferred shares. Basically, they've been to the VC, so at least seven VC rounds. They had 86 million restricted stock units. Remember, that's how they compensate employees. They had 44.16 million employee options. Now do you see why if I just take the share count given by a bank where they often ignore restricted stock units and options? I'm going to, I'm going to significantly overvalue my company. So read the prospectus. The numbers are there. They're just hoping you don't read it and go along with whatever they give us a share count. So the number of op common shares, I included everything but the options. As for the option value, I treated them as options, valued them with an option pricing model, just like I would any other publicly traded company. But the challenge here was I didn't have a stock price. So I actually had to use my estimated value per share to value the options. A few more contortions but I'm basically trying to get to the same place I did. So now let's talk about the investment banking guarantee. Investment bankers guarantee a price. This sounds like a great deal. Until you realize the price is about 20% below what they can get. Of course, sometimes they screw up even with that 20% discount. But in most IPOs, 95% of IPOs, you're going to get your offering price. The only problem is the offering price is just the starting point on the offering day. Guess what you find? You find that the stock price goes up. So I talked about how that offering price is set. So let's go back to the pricing I did for Twitter. The pricing, if you remember, is based on the number of share in the number of users they have. You know? So if you take the users and you build it in the price per user, you can come up with 40 billion, 45 billion in estimated pricing. But if your job is pricing, I think it makes far more sense to focus on a reasonable pricing for the company. But whatever that pricing is, you're still going to discount it because you don't want to guarantee that price. And the way this shows up is on the offering day. If you look at what IPOs do, and this is one of the most established findings in finance, there is about a 10, 15% jump in the price. 
if you're interested, there's a guy called Jay Ritter, whose life has been looking at IPOs. And he actually keeps track of number of IPOs per year and the percentage change on the opening day for every stock. You can go back to 1970 and see on, and every year, you see the numbers go up and down, but they're always a jump on the open, on, on the first day of trading. What does that mean? The people who receive shares at the offering price are being given a gift. In the old days, those people used to be preferred clients. So if you were Goldman Sachs, you made this offering to your preferred clients. Now, whether any of you know of Roy Smith, but Roy used to teach here. He used to teach an investment banking class, but he used to be head of Goldman Sachs International before he came to Stern. So he was obviously on the preferred client list. And I still remember when, um, I don't know whether it was Twitter or some, it might have been something further down the road. Another IPO came about and he came to my office and said, hey, Goldman Sachs told me I could get in at the offering price. Should I do it? And I said, be very careful because nothing that banks do is for free. So if you are one of those preferred clients, one of the conditions they will impose on you implicitly or explicitly is we, if you get shares at the offering price, you can't trade those shares two days after. you got to hold a certain period. You're saying, what are the legal implications if I sub? You could probably get away with it, but you're never going to be a preferred client after. So this seems like a freebie for preferred clients. But what about the rest of us? This doesn't just seem like a way in which you, know, you and I could make money. What, no, why can't we just put in, uh, you know, because the way offerings work is you put in an application for, I want 1,000 shares in this offer. Why don't we just put in offerings for every single IPO? Because if on average, you, you see this 15% jump, shouldn't that portfolio of stocks you get by applying to every IPO deliver 15% returns? Or what am I missing? Because if it's that easy to make money, there should be funds that do this, right? So what is it about this process that takes away my profits? Yes? You're just going to get paid up and then they won't. Well, remember the offering price is set. You, if you get bid up afterwards. You wanted to get bid up afterwards, but if you can get into the offering price and this research is right, you should get that 15% bump, right? But I'm saying when they fill the order book, the offering price is going to be. Oh, no, they don't. It just, what happens is the offering price is set too low. Once the offering price is set, they can't reset it. But you know how they adjust for the fact that they don't. You want, I think the thing which I have observed is that in the good IPOs, which actually go out, there is a very less likelihood of getting. In other words, if you ask for a thousand shares and they've all, they've underpriced the shares, you'll get 200 or 120. You're not going to get every share. In the bad IPOs, guess what you do? You get a thousand shares of every bad IPO. In other words, when you look at your portfolio, it's overweighted towards the badly priced IPOs and underweighted with the very best IPOs. So people have tried this because the very first research showed up almost 40 years ago. And the funds that were created to do this almost never deliver excess returns. So it looks like it's, 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 it's easy money, but it's not simply because of the way this process plays out. Of course, you know, we, we looked at this, you know, why would the company go along to selling 100% of the shares? Obviously you wouldn't. But if you're selling 10 or 12%, you view this almost as a loss leader. You take the loss because you hope that it eventually pays off. So don't do anything different in valuation when you do IPOs, but remember to mop up. Mop up for that offering proceeds. So you've got to add an extra line into that. So using my FCF of Ginzo model, add an extra line for IPO proceeds. Make your option pricing model. Instead of using the current price, use your estimated value per share. But check out the iteration box. And it should work perfectly well for an IPO valuation. Professor, yes. Do option markets pop up for like pretty much immediately after an IPO. So. Well, it doesn't matter, right? Even if option markets don't pop up, what, what in the option market would you find useful in your valuation? Uh, nothing in terms of the Because these are employee options, right? The, I mean, there might be a listed options market which you can use to get implied variance, which is probably the one input. Yeah. But it's not a big deal implied variance is not it's it's something you can estimate by just looking at industrial averages see there's not that much more you can learn even if an option market does pop up now of course the last five years you've had challenges to the existing ipo model the ipo model that i just described of an investment banking guarantee has been around about 80 years and it's getting really creaky it's getting creaky and 
people are picking it apart. They're saying, why are we paying the bankers this much money? If you're a banker, what's your response? What are the services you provide to a company going public? What risk? You guaranteed a price 20% below the current price. That's like a realtor saying, I'm taking a risk, but by the way, I'll knock off 20% of your price. In fact, if you knock the price off enough, you can almost guarantee my proceeds, right? But if you go to the market and if I issue this IPO, I may not be Or I might get a lot more. I mean, if, you're, if the price jumps 30% on the offering day, I don't... You know, so I'll tell you what they offer. Historically, they said, you need us because we can price your shares. We're pricing experts, right? Second, we're marketing people. We can market to all the funds. So the second service they provided, we can, we're the ones who know the institutional investors. And the third is they said, nobody knows who you are. We're Goldman Sachs. If we attach your name to you, you all of a sudden will have credibility. Those were the three sales pitches that held the system together for the last century. You see why each of those sales pitches is starting to fail? Let's take Facebook going public. What the heck is Goldman Sachs going to offer Facebook? More people probably had heard of Facebook than Goldman Sachs, to be quite honest, in 2012. So many of these companies have names that are actually recognizable. So if you're a company with a name that people recognize, the credibility story is gone. Say, so what about the pricing? Given how bad bankers price things, what the heck am I paying for? I could put in a computer model and essentially get a better price. You see, what about the marketing? Again, how much marketing is needed if you're setting the offering price below 20%, everybody recognizes your name? This is not true for all companies, but you can see for the highest profile IPOs, people are saying, why are we leaving five, six, seven percent of the proceeds on the table to the bankers? Yeah. Would you expect to see more direct listings? So that was the first choice, and this is a choice that a couple of VCs in, in our, Bill Gurley, for instance, has been pushing for this for the last four years. Direct listing, you go directly to the market. An auction, so basically the market opens, whatever the price, there's no discount. But direct listings have a catch. It's an imposed catch. It's an SEC imposed catch. You know what it is? You're not allowed to keep the proceeds in the company. You know, so remember how, so it's, a, it's, it's an SEC imposed requirement that if you do a direct listing, owners can cash out. So Spotify, owners cashed out, that you can do as a direct listing. But if you want to keep the cash in the company, at least right now, direct listings have, that pro, uh, have a problem. And of course, in the last two years, you've had a third approach to IPOs, which is SPACs, where you essentially let a celebrity do the testing for you. That's the reality, right? It's part of the world we live in, is let Chamat Palapathia go out and, you know, they, he knows more about young tech companies than you and I do. Basically, you turn that, that, you, the power over and say, look, I'll give you the money, you go find a company, you find the best price, and I trust you to do this. Yes? But if you kind of do like a like a fundraising round, like a series F or something, and then do a direct listing. That's after. the way in which people who've done direct listings have gotten around it, is you can do the direct listing. And in fact, right after the direct listing, you can issue capital, right? You just have to do it in two rounds. But I think the reality is the existing IPO model is broken. That's what SPACs and direct listings are bringing out. What the end game here is, I'm not sure. My guess is it'll be some hybrid. For some companies, the banking model will continue to work. If you have a low profile company that needs an investment banks, marketing skills and credibility for those companies back, but I think with much smaller fees. For some companies, you're gonna see direct listings, especially with high profile companies that people recognize. And for some companies, maybe, maybe SPACs will work as long as the SPAC promoters don't end up taking away 20% of your money as they do right now. Yes. So you have a direct listing um, you know, these companies are only offering their shares to the public ideally once, right? The IPO happens typically one time. No, the, the offering happens once, but the existing owners over time essentially sell their shares as well, right? Sure. But that'll be in a market which already has a market price. But the offering happens only once, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if you think there's any value in hiring banker just because they've done the process so many times, right? So like, it doesn't make sense for... Doing the same process badly over and over and over again 
is not, I mean, that, that's a problem. It, it's, like, it's like a serial killer claiming to know the meaning of life because they've killed a lot of people over time. Right. I mean, that's what bankers are offering. Look how much we've mangled the last hundred offerings. We can mangle your offering just as badly. Now, I know that sounds cynical, but the more I see what bankers do in IPOs, the less I see of what services they offer. I used to think bankers offered more in services until I started to see how they put a number on companies, how they were just gauging demand and supply. And doesn't the company still have to hire someone to do the process? What? For the SEC, what do you do? The SEC filing? No, that's a that's a legal process. You can, I mean, remember how cable got unbundled? You know, basically, you take the IPO process can be unbundled. There are services, and you can pay for the services. There's a service that'll that'll file. I mean, in fact, in Silicon Valley, there are there are services that can specifically do the SEC filings and do that part of the process. The pricing, just hire a smart guy out of Stanford, give him the data, I'd wager you'd get a much better price than the pricing you're getting from banks. The marketing kind of does itself, right? I mean, if you're, so I'm not sure any of the services that bankers are offering for most IPOs, for some IPOs, the services still might matter. And that's why I think it's gonna be a hybrid that ends up surviving. But you know, it's very difficult to justify what bankers charge given what they offer. Yes. Do you and want that care? I'm so are they doing it for free? Are they charging you? I mean, what are the services is Goldman offering you that you look at? Maybe the cell side equity research can be turned in your favor, right? So if there are services, it's going to be services that are at best shady now, why why do you need a go i mean come on you can go down the list of services and one by one i can knock off 10 cheaper ways you can do every one of them it's becoming difficult to, to defend the kinds of services that you get specific you know why you might want goldman in your corner because if somebody tries to acquire you use goldman as a shield that's the reality. That's what will keep investment banking going. Is there going to be the shield that you can use for unpleasant things? It's not my fault. Goldman made me do it. Okay. That's an expensive, expensive cop art along the way. One final example. You know, you have a small private business. Right now, it's, you're in, it's all your money. You're completely undiversified. You asked me to value you. I said, look, you're completely undiversified. Your correlation with the market is 0.25. Therefore, your total beta is four. I come up with the high cost of equity. But you have a plan. You say, look, in year two, based on my projections, I'll be approaching a VC, an angel VC. These are VCs who invest primarily in young startups. Yeah. And that VC is a little more diversified than I am. You know, they invest only in businesses like mine. Their correlation of their portfolio with the market is 0.5. Same company, but because they're more diversified, they see less risk. The total beta drops to two. Then in year three, um, so this is in stage three, in your five years from now, this is all being done today. You say, I'll be big enough to go public and I'm going to go to the market. Your beta goes to one. So basically it's the same company, but you can see a beta shifting over time, not because the risk is shifting, but because of who's investing in the company. If you ask me to value this company, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to project out cash flows just like I would for any other company. But rather than use one of these three discount rates as my discount rate, I'm going to use all three. And here's why. In the first two years, it's the owner's money, completely undiversified. I'm going to use that cost of equity from a total beta of four. In the next three years, it's venture capital money, which is partially diversified. I use that venture capitalist estimate of the total beta, which is lower, which gives me a lower cost of equity. And for, for my terminal value, I use a market beta. Three different betas delivering three different signals to me. The terminal values to a public market, I use the bit. But when I do my valuation, you will see three costs of equity. And one final thing, to get the terminal value back to today, I have to discount back at the high cost of equity I have in the first five years. Why? Because I have to live through the first five years to get to Nirvana. I have high risk, I've got to bring that in. So this is something we've always done our valuations, let discount rates change over time, but here it's changing, not because the risk of the business is changing, 
but the perception of that risk based on who's investing in the company. So here are the final propositions about private company valuation. When you look at va the value of private, at, at private companies and you look at what happens when they transition to public companies, the value of a private company as it transitions to a public company will be higher because investors in the company are more diversified. Now you could also accomplish the same thing by selling your private business to a public company, but either way you're getting those diversified investors. So as you go through this process, the implications kind of emerge. <clears throat> Sectors which are hot in terms of going public, private companies in that sector will always be worth more. There's a reason that a young privately owned software business is always going to be worth more than a young privately owned restaurant. Because you're a young privately owned restaurant, you're not thinking IPO, you're thinking, will I make it to year five? And will I make it as a restaurant? Young software company, every software entrepreneur is saying, when will I go public or how will I cash out? Second, as IPOs boom and bust, private company valuations will increase and decrease. If you look at the US over the last 50 years, there have been years where there have been almost no IPOs and years where there are dozens of IPOs. And private company owners often ask, why should I care? If you're in a market where IPOs have dried up, guess what? When I do my valuation of your company, that exit is no longer premised on the notion you can go public. Think of how much lower my value would be if in that previous example, I'd left your company in the hands of venture capitalists, much lower terminal value. And finally, private companies in countries which have easy access to capital markets. Let's face it, one of the reasons tech companies end up being in the US is because it's easier to go public in the US than pretty much any market in the world. If I take that same company and transplant it to Brazil or India, it's the same company. I will get a much lower value for the same company because that exit. Now, thank God, even in India and Brazil, that exit is more, more likely now than 30 or, 30 or 40 years ago as a young company in India. You pretty much had no exit into the public markets. Your best case scenario is you went to a public company and if they were feeling generous, they might pay you 20% more than what you were worth as a private to private transaction. The second is when you look at the value of private business that expects to make the tra transition to a public company sooner rather than later, they expect a much higher value. One final point, in the old days, you really had private markets and public markets. It's pretty clear dividing line. In the last 15 years, you have this gray market that's emerged in the middle where you're not quite public, but you're not quite private either. You know what I'm talking about? Secondary. Facebook spent almost, I'm sorry? Secondary. Oh, it's a secondary market. But if you think about Facebook, it spent 10 years or eight years as a private company where it raised money from public market investors. Same thing with Uber, right? Uber spent seven years where they could have gone public raising money from the Saudi investment from. So you've essentially created this middle market where you're being priced as if you're a public company, which reduces your incentive to actually go public. Why go through that disclosure process when you can raise the capital? You know that public companies today are going public at much higher market caps, less form business model, much higher market caps than 20 years ago, 40 years ago. All reflections of exactly what you'd expect. So final thoughts in private company valuation, you know, you, you, you don't break the rules of valuation, you still have to do it, but your value is going to be a function of who you sell your business to. You always have to have motive nailed down. You can't value a private company without doing it. Okay? So if you're valuing a private company for transactions, look at who's buying the company. If you're valuing it for legal purposes, do whatever you need to do. You have, other, you have other objectives in mind, right? It's not about getting the best value, it's about paying the least in taxes. And I'm not gonna judge you for doing that. I mean, there'll be another expert witness on the other side pushing against you, but this has nothing to do with the right value. So always factor those thoughts in and you know, private companies are just more work, the more difficult to value. It's tougher to figure out whether you got the right answer but you have to do it because you might own a private business, you might have a friend or a family member who owns a private business, or you might be a private company appraiser, in which case this is your job. Any questions on valuing private businesses?
I know you didn't bring your prayer pack of three, but I'm going to get started because what we're going to talk about next is perhaps the only part of corporate finance or valuation, which you can think of as new and different. It's this notion of real options. To give you a sense of how much real options have become part of the discussion valuation, about 25 years ago, I went on and I, I checked to see whether there were any real options books out there. There were like two. Today, real options have become one of those buzzwords. People use it all the time. And I'll explain why people like it. It gives you a way of explaining a premium on top of an intrinsic value. That's basically what real options allow you to do. If the intrinsic value of something at 100 million, intrinsic value rules say don't pay more than 100 million. A real options argument, which is well-framed and well-founded, will allow you to pay more than the 100 million. You see why this is so attractive? In acquisitions, you like a target company. On a discounted cash flow basis, the company doesn't look good. Maybe there's some optionality that will allow you to pay a premium. So I call this the search for the elusive premium. And I'm going to talk about four types of options. First is, you can have investments that look bad today. But if you have exclusive rights to that investment, the right to delay or defer that investment is like an option. So I'll explain why. Second, if you have a company that can adjust its production schedules based on observing a price of a commodity or something else, it's got optionality, right? Because you don't want to value based on an actual schedule, it's going to vary the schedule. Third, and this is where it, you know, I think real option people get really excited. If you're entering a new market, especially a new big market, even though your initial investment doesn't look attractive, you might do it anyway. Why? Because if you enter the market and things work out, think of the huge potential of growth. I argued in the first 10 or 15 years of US companies entering China that almost none of them entered because they were making money on their initial investment. They were doing it because the market was so big that they said, if this works out, think of how much money we could make. And finally, there is this option of stopping production, of abandoning things if they don't work out. It's the option to abandon. What does this all mean? These options are value. And if the value is large enough to, to justify it, you might actually take a negative net present value investment because you get these positive values. So what I'd like to do is actually give you a very simple example of where this optionality comes from. So let's assume that I come to you with a decision. It's a 50% chance you could make 100 million and a 50% chance you could lose 120 million. What's the expected value of this investment? Minus 10, right? So you wouldn't do it. I'm going to play a little game here. Let's suppose I take that same investment and I break it up into two pieces. So the first leg, you there's a 75% chance of making plus 20 and a 25% chance of losing 20. But if you observe the minus 20 outcome, you just stop because there's a signal, it's a bad project. But if you get the plus 20, you continue. And there's a two thirds chance of making 80 and a one third chance of losing 100. If you look at my collective losses, 120, my collective gains are 100. My expected likelihood of the upside is 50%. My expected likelihood of the downside is 50%. Roughly speaking, it is the same investment you saw on the previous page broken down into two stages. This is like magic, but if you compute the expected value of this decision tree, it goes from negative to positive. So tell me what it is about the second choice that made your bad investment into a good investment. What's happening in the second decision tree that's giving you an advantage? You don't have to make the $100 investment right now. You can see what happens in the future. In other words, your learning by seeing what's happening the first stage, and then you're adapting your behavior. And you see what I mean by adapting your behavior? Your decision at the second stage is conditioned on what you learned in the first stage. Learning and adaptive behavior, that is at the heart of the real options argument. Let me give you an example. I'm gonna argue that when you value an oil company, there's an optionality that you're missing with a traditional discounted cash flow model. You know what the optionality is? When you do a traditional discounted cash flow valuation, you estimate number of barrels of oil and an expected oil price. Let's say you're completely unbiased in those numbers. You come up with the value. What you've missed is the number of barrels of oil that the oil company produces is not set in stone. What does the oil company get to observe before it decides how much oil to produce? It gets to observe the oil price. The oil price is high, it produces more. If the oil price is low, it produces less. 
learning plus adaptive behavior. Anytime you have learning and adaptive behavior, you have optionality because you're changing the way you behave based on what you've learned. And that could get, it's not that you're not doing your job in discounted cash flow evaluation, but this is a contingent cash flow based on what you've learned. And that's what you're missing in an option, if you don't use an option pricing model. So as we go through this real options discussion, I'm gonna approach it as a skeptic and here's why. People are using real options, as I said, as a buzzword. They use it for everything. And I want you to be able to ask the right questions on, is this the right kind of example to use a real, because they, are, they want you to pay a premium, right? And you don't want to pay a premium for nothing. So you want to make sure that the real options argument actually applies. So here are the three questions I'm going to ask before I allow you to use a real options premium. First, I'm going to ask you, is there an option here? And we're going, to, we're going to see how to identify an option. It's actually very simple. If you remember your first foundations class in options, you show me the payoff diagram on an asset. I can guess whether there's an option there. Second, when does that option have significant economic value? When should I even care? Is this big enough for me to even care about? Or is it cents on the dollar where it's kind of creating noise in the process? And third, when can I actually value that option? When is there an option? When does that option have significant economic value? And when can I value the option? I'm going to make a statement up front. I'll try to back it up. For every hundred decisions where I see real options arguments used, maybe 20 of them actually have an option. Other, the other 80 people are mistaking something that's an opportunity for an option. Among the 20, maybe four have significant economic value. The remaining 16, there's an option, but it's not worth even spending money. And among the four that have significant economic value, maybe one or two can actually be valued with an option pricing. So let's start by asking the question, when is there an option embedded in a decision? To see, you know, what, what, to see that, you actually have to go back and think about what makes an option an option. Let's break options down. First, an option gives you the right, as opposed to what? an obligation. There's no obligation. It's a right. You have the right to either buy or sell something at a fixed price. The right to buy is a call option. The right to sell is at a fixed price. The price has to be specified up front. Second, there's got to be a certain underlying asset. Options are derivative assets. They're leeches. They derive their value from something else. So when you tell me something is an option, I'm going to ask you, what's the underlying asset? You have trouble telling me what the underlying asset is. I'm walking away. And third, options usually have you know, a specific event that kicks off. Something has to happen for you to make. So fixed price, underlying asset, contingency. And of course, if you've ever taken an options class or even had an options session, we know what makes options special is the payoff diagram. This is, of course, the payoff diagram for a call option. And what makes it different from the payoff diagrams you see for assets is this finite loss, fixed loss. You cannot lose more than what you paid for the option. Why? It's a right. Nobody can force you to do something. So the most you can lose is what you pay for the asset. Limited losses, potentially unlimited profits of the call option. On a put option, of course, you reverse things. You have limited losses still, and you have, I wouldn't say unlimited profits. Why? Because the price usually can't go below zero, but potentially very big profits. What makes options special is the fact that you have fixed or finite losses and potentially very large gains if you're the buyer of the option. So here's what I'm going to do with every real option that I introduce. And we're going to talk about quite a few. I'm going to draw the payoff diagram for that asset. And if you see something that looks like this or the, or the, or the picture for a call option, have to dig very deep. There is an option there. You can ask, does it have significant economic value? So when does an option have significant economic value? I'm going to introduce a word here that I use whenever people use real options arguments. On it. It's exclusivity. For an option to have value, you and only you have to be able to use that right. The further you get away from exclusivity, the less value there is to the option. I'll give you an example. Let's suppose you're Marriott. You open 10 hotels in China. 
you know you're going to lose money. So you walk in with open eyes expecting to lose money. You're saying, why would I do that? You do it because China is a really big market. And if these 10 hotels do well, you plan to open 100 more hotels or even 500 more hotels. Think of the upside, right? So drawn by that possibility, you say, let me lose. I'm okay losing money in these 10 hotels because look at how much upside I can get. Sounds like an options argument, right? But what's the weakness in that argument? You open the 10 hotels, you observe them. There is no exclusivity. In other words, Hilton might be said, might send spies standing outside the hotel, watch where the people are going. So that hotel is doing really well. And just as you get ready to open your 500 new hotels, Hilton beats you to the punch. Saying, so what could give you exclusivity? What if the Chinese government says, look, if you open these 10 hotels, we'll give you the exclusive right to open hotels in this region of China. That is an option. That's what you're looking for. So when somebody uses a real options argument, the question I is, where is the exclusivity? I'll give you another example. Right now, when people look at platform businesses, you know what I'm talking about? Business like Facebook or Twitter, they talk about the optionality. Think of all the nice things and great things we can do with the platform. I'm willing to listen, but the question I'm going to have is, where's the exclusivity? Where is it that key? And with Facebook, the answer is there on our platform an hour every day. Strong argument with Twitter, much weaker argument because those people are all over the place. They're in 15 different platforms. Why should I pay a premium on your platform? Because you're not exclusive. So when is there an option? When, when it is a sign? And if you decide a significant economic value, you're almost there, right? Because we know what drives the value of an option. In fact, let's list out the six variables, and there are only six. This is not like DCF valuation. We get distracted. Only six variables that determine the value of an option. Three relate to the underlying asset. As the value of the underlying asset goes up and down, all options attached to it will be affected, right? If you have the right to buy a stock at a fixed price or the right to buy something at a fixed price, as the asset value goes up, call options become more valuable, put options become less valuable. It will also depend on the variance in that value. And this is where options, you got to almost reorient your thinking. Because up till now, whenever we've talked about risk, in the context of lowering value. Right? In discounted cash flow valuation, increase risk. Discount rates go up, value goes down. In pricing, you increase risk, you pay a lower PE ratio, a lower price to book ratio. But in the case of options, as you increase the variance in the value of the underlying asset, both call and put options become more valuable. We talked about this intuition very early in the class. Let's see if you remember why with options, risk becomes your ally rather than your enemy. What is it about options that makes risk your ally? Think of the payoff diagram. What did I give you? I, I fixed your loss on the downside. You can never lose more than what you paid, right? To you, higher variance, you can't lose more. Higher variance gives you only upside. So risk becomes one-sided. So the higher the variance in the value of the underlying asset, the more valuable options become. And I'm going to use this word, at least with listed stocks, you can see why. When I buy a call option on a stock and it pays a dividend, my call options become less valuable. You know why? Because when a company pays a dividend, on the X, it's pure me purely mechanical. On the day that you pay a dividend, your stock price drops by the amount of the dividend. If it didn't, you'd have this great arbitrage opportunities. So when I buy a call option on a stock with expected dividends, I have to reduce the value of the option by the amount of expected dividends I will receive during the life of the option because I know my price is going to drop on that day. Value of the asset, variance of the asset, expected dividends. There are two features of the option itself that affect its value. One is the strike price. With a call option, I gave you the right to buy something at a fixed price, right? Would you want that price to be lower or higher? Is the right to buy something at $1,000 more valuable, less valuable than the right to buy the same thing at $100? It's less value because basically the right to buy something at 100 is much more valuable. So as strike prices go down, call options become more valuable, put options become less valuable. And the life of the option. For obvious reasons, the more time I let you give you to play this game, the more valuable all options become. We're almost there. There's only one macro variable that affects the value of an option. And that's the level of interest rates. And here's why. 
What do you get with the call? The right to buy something at a fixed price, right? So if interest rates go up, the present value of that fixed price becomes lower. So the right to buy something at a fixed price will become more valuable as interest rates go up. Because in a sense, you're paying less. With a put option, what do you get? The right to sell something at a fixed price. As interest rates go up, guess what? The value of what you're going to receive two years from now, three years from now becomes less. So as interest rates go up, put options become less valuable. It's the only macro variable. So I'm going to lay out, I know option pricing is this place you can get lost. I'm going to lay out the broad principles that drive all option pricing models. Until 1971, the way people valued options was they treated it like any other asset. They expected cash flows, discount rates. Paul Samuelson has this very famous model for valuing options. But two professors at the University of Chicago kind of revolutionized the way you think about options. Fisher Black and Martin Schultz. And I'll tell you what they did. They said, look, we can create something that looks exactly like the option in terms of what? Delivering the same cash flows by combining the underlying asset and by either borrowing or lending. And I'll show you the mechanics of doing it, but you can create something that looks exactly like the option. That's a replicating portfolio. That's the first principle they drew on. And then they said, if the replicating portfolio and the option have the same cash flows, they have to sell at the same price. Replication plus arbitrage lies at the heart of every option pricing model. So the way you can actually see this simplest is what's, what's called a binomial model, but every one of these models, and I'll take you to the binomial model next class, that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to create the replicating portfolio. So if I can create the replicating portfolio and see how much it would cost me to create it today, I've in a sense valued the option. So while you get lost in Black-Scholes models or binomial models, Remember, that is at the core of every single option pricing model. So let me lay out at least the broad principles. If you need replication and arbitrage to use an option pricing model, option pricing works best when everything is traded. The option is traded, the stock is traded, you can borrow and lend at the risk-free rate. And that's going to be the Achilles heel in valuing real options. We're going to value a patent as an option. The problem with using an option pricing model there is, you can't trade the patent. You can't trade the underlying drug. You're using option pricing in places where you're really pushing the limits of option pricing models. So we'll start next class with binomial and black shows and very like a five or 10 minute introduction and then start using these models on real options. So I'll see you after. So the quiz is in the first 30 minutes as always. And then we'll actually have class after that. I'll do that, yeah, I'll do it. Okay.